Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Valence. I say propaganda art, you say Nazi Germany. This is the received opinion which a new book by Jonas Stahl, Propaganda Art in the 21st Century, seeks to re-examine. The book describes and problematizes the relationship between art, propaganda and democracy, and it offers a theoretical reading of some contemporary cultural and political phenomena as propaganda art. Well, I'm very happy that Jonas Stahl joins me today. Welcome to the show, Jonas. Thank you. Well, Jonas, you're a self-professed propaganda artist, and it's quite clear the questions of art's relationship with power and democracy and the ability to propagate such messages has been at the forefront of your interest. But I wonder whether we could start by exploring how you came to view propaganda as a critical lens. Well, um... I think my interest in the role of, uh, of of propaganda and art emerged from my own specific experience as a uh, as a Dutch citizen, in which the role of uh, the state has always has, since the post war period has always been very um, present when it comes to the production of art through art subsidies, the subsidizing of public art institutions, uh, and it, and it seemed at some point evident to me that. Uh, working in such a working in such a conditions means that there is still an, an an active intervention of the state, an active framing of art and culture as something that benefits the state or the identity of the state, even if uh, the this propagandistic relation, so to say, uh, is formulated in terms of art contributes to to society, represents diversity, or like uh, these very positivistic terms that that that. Um, that emphasize the freedom of artists to express themselves in a society. Uh, but exactly this, this expression of freedom, this idea that art is an expression of freedom, uh, is exactly what benefits uh, democratic states on a propagandistic level, to, to declare themselves free of propaganda. But of course, this happens by subsidizing the very same art that expresses this freedom. So it seemed evident to me that there was still a propagandistic relation, and it and it occurred to me that it wasn't addressed as such. That when we use the prop- the term propaganda, it always seemed to refer to a, a, to a so-called totalitarian past in which art was instrumentalized by dictatorships, or that if the term is used in our current time, that it refers to countries that are still associated with that age of totalitarianism. So we are very very easily terms of the term propaganda is used to describe. Putin's Russia or or uh, Kim Jong Un's uh, North Korea, but it's not used in the same way or at the same scale when it comes to democratic regimes. Uh, so that's something that that really that triggered me, really because of my own experience of being an artist in a context where uh, the state is very active in the production of art and culture, declares it as an expression of freedom, but at the same time this and this expression of freedom contributes to the the glorification of the idea of liberal democracy as uh, as something that is free of propaganda. So uh, this touches, I think, also on the paradox of democratic propaganda. The democratic propaganda has the has the aim aims not to be visible as propaganda, and art plays uh, a, a, an important role in that. I wonder if you could spell out some of the ways in which this kind of propaganda imperative of art has actually manifested itself in your practice, given that in a lot of your work you've been associated with organizations like BAC, BAC, Basis for Aktuelle Kunst in Utrecht, which are, examining the relationship between art and politics is part of the key mission. Well, I mean, for, for me, it's evident that there's always a relationship between art and power, um, and, and whether that power is, is maybe more uh, financial in nature, when we think of the way that art markets drive particular forms of art to be circulated traded in uh, to give uh, to 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 well to make capitalism more beautiful in uh, hito sterile's word in artist hito sterile's words or if it is an active state intervention there is always a relationship between there's always a relationship between between art and power and this not this is not necessarily a problem i think it's a problem when this relation becomes Obfuscated when it becomes uh, when it becomes hidden or or declared somehow neutral, and so in the way that the Dutch state uh, seems to consider its continuous investments in art and culture as something as something as something neutral, something that they that they um, that they finance but somehow are not involved uh, are not involved in. Um, so I, I don't consider that as a that inherently problematic, but it asks the question: with whom, with what kind of powers do we 
do we um, to which to what kind of powers do we relate ourselves as artists? Um, what kind of power do we help to legitimize and shape into into being? And which ones do we do we oppose? Um, I think looking at these questions from the prism of propaganda studies asks a more fundamental questions about um, fundamental question about the positioning of the artist in uh, relationship to uh, to given power structures. But as you uh, but you mentioned, I, I work with uh, different contemporary art institutions and, and museums who uh, share this let's say critical perspective of the role of art institutions that want to. Uh, that aim to overall highlight the um, economic, financial, ideological conditions in, from, from which we produce art and that believe that, that, that an important role that art can have is to contribute to popular imaginaries, popular movements, and that aim to create more egalitarian forms of society and therefore also more egalitarian forms of art because these two, these two things cannot be separated from one another. Well, with that in mind, let's get into the book itself. I think the central point you make right at the outset is that there is something to be gained from considering contemporary art, or at least aspects of contemporary art, as propaganda. And the theoretical apparatus which you deploy for this is inherited from Herman and Chomsky's ideas of manufacturing consent. And this proposes an explanation for a way in which art and media can be part of a propaganda machine without even realizing it. As you say, the chomsky hermann propaganda model that they described in the late uh, 80s in their book Manufacturing Consent is a really crucial part in, in my own uh, propaganda analysis because it's one of the few propaganda models, contemporary propaganda models, that applies not only to so-called dictatorships or authoritarian regimes, but predominantly uh, applies to American imperial, imperialist capitalist democracy. And that's unique because the, the whole history of them of democratic propaganda has been not to appear as um, propaganda to to create this kind of absolute uh, separation between uh, them the old totalitarian states or those remnants that still uphold its uh, its heritage propaganda belongs to that lineage and not ours um, we we uh, democracy uh, is democracy is democratic because it has freed itself from such totalitarian notions such as uh, propaganda and Chomsky and Hermann they they turn that upside they turn it upside down by uh, showing how uh, dominant media filters the use of misinformation uh, control over media and communication infrastructure the the use of what they refer to as the anti-communist filter which today would probably be referred to as the anti-islamist filter a creation of an us versus them binary us versus them dichotomy to create common enemies and manufacture a new consent, a new kind of negative social contract through this, um, this, this projected threat on the unity of a, of a nation, of a people very often driven by uh, white supremacist ideas. And, um, and, and they speak specifically of, of this propaganda model as a way of analyzing the, the performance of propaganda. And for me, from an artistic perspective, the term performance became immediately extremely important. And, and they, they use it in a very formal sense like the way uh, a company performs in this or that quarter so how does what is the procedural mechanism with which a propaganda operates through various filters to manufacture consent to create an, a new normative conception of reality that benefits certain elite stakeholders but for me this perfor- this question of performance immediately relates to form to the question how power performs as form through form through morphology through a genealogy of form uh, whether that is infrastructural in the form of, of city planning, whether it is um, more in more traditional forms of communication that we tend to associate with propaganda, such as advertisement campaigns or or posters, up until the the realm of of art and culture as such. So for me, that was this was where the dual reading of performance as enactment and as bringing into form made for me this uh, propaganda model crucial to to use as a basis to, to analyze contemporary forms of propaganda art. Before you do get to the contemporary, you offer a rereading of the 20th century art canon using the apparatus which you just developed. So the book deals mainly with the question of contemporary propaganda art and how forms of contemporary propaganda art operate within con- in contemporary democratic regimes. Um, but it also has a kind of historical backbone 
discussing some examples of uh, modern propaganda art and also to problematize some of uh, the examples that we tend to think we are more familiar with. So if, if someone asks today, um, what is propaganda um, and, and where does it come from? Most people will be tempted to, to, to equate it with, uh, with the history of Nazi Germany. Um, propaganda and the birth of so-called totalitarianism are always almost considered as the same thing. And, and there already we have to make some, some important remarks that uh, the, the first modern propaganda bureau emerged uh, uh, at the beginning of the First World War in the United Kingdom, in the imperial democracy of the United Kingdom. Um, it was known as Wellington House. It operated so secretively that even most uh, MPs were not aware of its existence. It used the whole red line colonial cable network that was created to oversee the British colonies as a way to intercept and manipulate information without either the Germans or the Americans even being aware of this process taking place. And this is, of course, the, the paradigm of democratic propaganda that I was talking about earlier. It operates through invisible filters, as is referenced in the Chomsky and Hermann uh, propaganda model. It needs to operate in a way without uh, the general population even being aware of its, of its existence, not to interrupt the idea or the mythology of uh, freedom that is so inherent to uh, for for democracy to remain to maintain its legitimacy, um, and if we follow the the diaries of uh, Adolf Hitler, he himself was convinced that he had lost that Germany had lost the First World War as a result of the of what he called the superior propaganda effort of the British, and he and Goebbels would model the propaganda apparatus of the Third Reich after that of the United Kingdom. Now that is not to say that propaganda in the UK and propaganda in, in uh, Nazi Germany are somehow the same. It just means they both use propaganda. It means that modern propaganda emerged from modern democracy and not from uh, dictatorship, that democracy as such is, is inherently implicated in the history of propaganda. And it means that we need to speak of propagandas in the plural because the uh, imperial democracy of the United Kingdom and Nazi Germany, politically speaking, in terms of what these powers wanted to achieve, uh, was obviously not the same. If they are not the same, that means their propagandas can, cannot be the same either. The infrastructures, the way they produce propaganda, consume propaganda, disseminate propaganda, is not, cannot be the same. And even if we look more specifically at examples of propaganda art in the context of Nazi Germany, these tend to be more complicated as well. First associations will quickly be with uh, films like uh, propaganda films like Der Ewige Jude by Fritz Hippler, very, very insidious documentary that uh, equates in a kind of full uh, documentary style um, uh, Jewish peoples with rats and with vermin. It's like an insidious editing that su suggests the, the, the kind of uh, aggressive colonization and that would be an inherent part of the Jewish people. Very in, uh, uses very intelligently the kind of supposed neutrality or objectivity of the documentary film language. And or we can think of obvious films like um, the, the works of Lenny Riefenstahl, the kind of epic representations of the eternal, uh, eternal Nazi Germany, na uh, gigantic marches, the hyper aestheticized bodies. These are the overt uh, forms of propaganda, often referred to as white propaganda, propaganda that you see and that you're almost aware of the fact that they are propaganda, that they are trying to achieve something. The highly ideologically charged, often very monumental in its, in its features, even though they have their own uh, insidious uh, uses uh, um, of, of editing, of, uh, of narrative building, etc., etc. But it's important to, to realize that in the context of Nazi Germany, these forms of overt propaganda were only uh, about, constituted only about 10% of film production. And that 90% were um, TV series and, and epic stories uh, like the Der Größte Liebe, The Great Love, one of the blockbuster films of the Third Reich that, that were uh, covert forms of propaganda. So they were not explicitly uh, propagating Nazi ideology. They were stories about great love stories. Of course, the war was always present, but as a kind of backdrop to family quarrels and love stories. And, um, but they helped to naturalize um, the, the, the Nazi regime as a kind of neutral, as a neutral backdrop. They didn't make it explicit. They, they made it normative. They helped to make it normative. And these were the successful films, very explicit ideological films 
uh, under the Nazi regime, the only reason, the only way to have an audience was that there was a, a mandated viewing for Nazi party members. And this, I think, is an important important note because it it means that uh, often we we tend to look back at periods of Stalinist Russia or Nazi Germany, and and somehow think how was it possible that people were not aware of what was communicated to them. Well, the fact that Nazi party members were obliged to view these uh, films meant that they were very aware of the fact that a evident uh, overt propaganda operation was being imposed on them. The success at that time, as it is now, is not to uh, is not is not this explicit approach, but a much more covert approach in which we normalize particular ideolog- ideological ideas and hierarchies through so-called entertainment. Uh, the more a, a person believes that they voluntarily consume these ideas and images, the more effective and the more embodied they will turn out to be on the long run. But it does seem to place art in a bit of a double bind in its relationship with power, doesn't it? If we agree that not every form of power is the same and that different forms of power generate different propagandas in the plural that manifest in, manifest in different forms of art and culture, that, that also allows to trace next to the more dominant genealogies of propaganda art, the role of art in, in the imperial democracy of the United Kingdom, where the birth of modern propaganda manifested, you could say, the role of art in, uh, the, in the context of dictatorships from Nazi Germany to, uh, to Stalinist uh, um, Russia, Stalinist Soviet Union, then we can also start tracing another history, the role of art in emerging form of powers or the role of propaganda art in, 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 uh, in forms of counterpower uh, from the anti-colonial movements to uh, the civil rights movements to black liberation to the feminist movements to ecological movements. There is, and I try to narrate in the book, uh, a long history of what we could call emancipatory propaganda art or popular propaganda art. That doesn't that doesn't start from a position of mass manipulation, um, but <clears throat> but considers propaganda propaganda and the propagandation of alternative horizons, the propagation of alternative forms of life, alternative forms of social and political and economic organization as a collective endeavor. So we're no longer talking about the propagandist behind the curtain, and that that manipulates the populace into uh, into one position or another, but. Um, a, a propagation that emerges through popular mass movements, for example, in the way that Judith Butler talks about the performative theory of assembly, the process in which people uh, pressured by precarious conditions of life seek for one another on streets and squares. And, and in their protest, in their coming together, even though that is not a voluntary choice, in the process of coming together, they start to enact through slogans and alternative infrastructures and, propo- and pro- proposals new imaginaries of new forms of life. They collectively propagate the alternative to what they are protesting against, whether that is a corrupt financial system, whether that is racial capitalism. Um, and and that, that history of propaganda, I think, is, is severely under-highlighted, and that has a lot to do with the, the campaign of the propaganda campaign against propaganda, which, which manifests for very good reasons, for very understandable reasons, of course, after the Second World War and the dismantling of the Nazi and dictatorship, and and from that moment onwards, and the origin of its of the term in the history of democracy, the importance of the term in um, popular mass movements and emancipatory movements uh, becomes less and less um, visible because the term becomes so discredited. So one of the things I'd like to trouble at this point in this parallel between the possibilities open to state propaganda and the propaganda of popular mass movements that you propose is the issue of unequal access to communication infrastructures. In the example of a first um, modernist propaganda that you bring up, the British Empire's Wellington House and its network, it strikes me that it is precisely the access to a telegraph cable network that makes this endeavour so successful. By contrast, today's popular movements, such as, say, Occupy or Black Lives Matter, um, often rely on communication networks that it do not control. I think the first is the first point that, that might be important to make is that I don't think that that uh, when we speak of propaganda art, that every form of propaganda art is merely the expression, uh, the instrument of a state or of a of a corporate or of a non-state power of a corporate power. 
Uh, I think that there is in, in many in many cases you will find that propagandas produce particular conditions for the production of art uh, in shaping power, in shaping a new reality, a new the manufacturing a new consent. Um, but art shapes that forms of that form of power just the same. I don't believe that by definition in every circumstance art is always merely at the receiving end of a given power, that it has a relative me to interrogate and to challenge uh, dominant powers at the same time to which it might be to which it might be tied um, but to come to come to your question the um, chomsky and Hermann propaganda model that i base that i work out in 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 the book they are they argued uh, propaganda is essentially the performance of power it's the way in which infrastructures of power whether it's in the mass media the military industrial complex or or culture how they uh, contribute to constructing a new normative reality, meaning that propaganda is not merely about communication, propaganda is about reality construction, it's about world making, you could say. And that opens the question, well, how do different forms of power operate? How do different forms of power perform? How do they translate into form? And I think you make a very good point that in my book, I try to show a wide range of examples, the role of uh, of, of the performance of power in relationship to art in the context of the war on terror, alt-right movements, the emergence of the Islamic State, as well as historical examples that we touched upon earlier. Um, but I also include examples from popular mass movements, from, from the Los Indignados to, Occup to Occupy to Black Lives Matter, as well as different stateless insurgencies from the Kalt Tamashek insurgency in the, in the um, northern part of Mali, in the region of the Sahara and the Sahel, as well as the Kurdish revolutionary movement in uh, Rojava in the northern part of Syria. And of course, the, the, the types of infrastructures available uh, to these uh, different forms of power is, is, is highly different. And you could say that once we start to, look, to analyze propaganda in the, in the relationship to popular mass movements or stateless insurgencies, that they are first of all forms of counter power, that they are resisting towards a form of common oppression. They are not in the position of of hegemony, they have not monopolized infrastructures of mass communication and mass manipulation, as is the case in the examples you just gave, like of that of the British Empire. But of course, that, that but that doesn't mean that what they represent that that it doesn't mean that they are powerless. Uh, and and here I try to, to to kind of insist on something that Chomsky and Hermann don't. They say yeah, propaganda is the performance of power. They all only look at dominant forms of power, monopolized forms of power. Uh, but emerging forms of power are attempting at processes of world making, of new reality construction, of, of establishing a new consent about, uh, around rights, about redistribution of wealth, around colonial reparation. They do represent the power. They are more than counterpower. They build from an um, insistence on, on the necessity of establishing new egalitarian life forms. So denying their place in the history of propaganda, I felt was was fundamentally wrong. And there's also a more general question that makes it on the research level: When is power established enough to be able to start researching propaganda? Because it would suggest, for example, that insurgent movements, and if we think, for example, in the field of the alt right, whether it's like the, the so-called armed patriot movements, the the Tea Party leading up to uh, the Trumpist and alt-right movements, like in which phase are we allowed to start talking about propaganda? I would say from the, the from the moment of insurgence onwards, the insurgence that starts to claim a new um, a demand, a new hegemony over our common reality, from that moment onwards, whether they are yet in power or building towards coming into power, from that moment onwards, propaganda be, propaganda analysis becomes relevant. Um, but obviously, that does also mean to uh, to recognize that in analyzing these different propagandas with fundamentally different ideological objectives expressed in fundamentally different forms of art, uh, we have to acknowledge that they depart from different positions of power. The the scale of power to produce propaganda that is available to the to the United uh, United States is not the same as the scale of power. That is available to the revolutionaries, the Kurdish revolutionaries that read the, the Rojava Autonomous uh, Project. But in both cases, from very different perspectives, I think a propaganda analysis is relevant because it's about understanding the form of uh, the world-making force or the world-making objectives that these 
very different, often oppositional organizations uh, want to achieve, want to, um, want to establish. Well, let's do that then. Let's perform the propaganda analysis on a couple of your examples, which is essentially what you do in the second part of the book, where you start chapter three with an account of the United States in the early 2000s and the propaganda of the war on terror, which I think is an uncontroversial type of analysis by now. But an actor that turns up in your narrative, which I think might be a little bit surprising to your readers and our listeners, is the character of Steve Bannon, who you essentially characterize as a propaganda artist. Yeah, so Steve Bannon is an important case study in the book because he shows how the role of art and the role of artistic imagination can also pre-configure political change. And this, this comes back to the point I tried to make earlier, that it's not that propaganda art does not always necessarily uh, follow as a purely passive instrumental form and uh, dominant, dominant forms of power, that, that the role of propaganda art can also contribute to inciting new forms of political configuration. Bannon is mainly known as the head of campaign of uh, Trump when he came to power in 2016, his uh, ideological uh, advisor and policy advisor throughout the first year of his presidency, uh, the co-founder of the Breitbart News uh, self-declared home of the alt-right uh, network. Uh, this is the kind of Bannon that became, that became the public figure um, around the, the ascent of Trump to power. But in the about 20 years preceding that, uh, Bannon developed around uh, 10 different documentary-styled film pamphlets. He called it, calls it the form of kinetic cinema which if you trace them from 2004 onwards, when he made his first, fi first film in the face of evil, really um, narrates the configuration that we come to know as Trumpism. In a way, Bannon imagines through his films Trumpism before Trump even comes to the political stage, enters the political stage as a, as a political leader figure. And in, 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 in 2004, in his first film, In the Face of Evil, it is... It is a story about the fight of Reagan against communism. The argument Bannon makes is that the return of evil is a cyclical process. What was once Nazism becomes communism, becomes Islamic terrorism. He ends the film with the attacks of the Twin Towers. He essentially argues that the clash of civilization we face is cyclical. Evil returns in every generation, and every generation has a historical uh, duty to re-establish the values of white Christian economic nationalism. And these that that line of terms, white Christian economic nationalism, that is essentially what becomes Trumpism. Uh, and what first was what first is, is Reagan, the strong leader figure that has to uh, lead this epic battle against uh, corrupt globalists, against uh, a, a cultural Marxists, against Islamic extremists. Um, that becomes later on Sarah Palin when uh, Bannon makes uh, film pamphlets for different leaders in the Tea Party movement, and, and that later on turns Trump. Uh, Bannon himself refers to Sarah Palin as Trump before Trump, just as I refer to Bannon's work as uh, a cultural imagination, a cultural configuration of the narrative of Trumpism before Trump comes to the stage. So, so I think Bannon is a, is a relevant figure not only to see how he was shaped by different political forces, first paleoconservatism, moving to the Tea Party, moving to Trumpism, but how his work was contributing to each of these movements, movements at the same time, amongst others through his uh, cinematic work, through his so-called kinetic cinema, which he himself says is inspired simultaneously by Lenny Riefenstahl, Sergei Eisenstein, and Michael Moore. Uh, which immediately also shows this kind of characteristic alt-right signature of using extremely contradictory sources, communist revolutionary art history to Nazi uh, film history to kind of like film history of progressive liberals to confuse opponents about where Bannon's own position exactly lies. He's in that sense also an orchestrator of narratives, combining sources in such a way that it becomes possible to talk about Riefenstahl because he mentioned it at the same time as its absolute opposite. So there you see also how his, the, the language that he uses around his films, around his cultural works, allows to, to manufacture a new consent, a consent in which uh, uh, references to uh, total war, a term that actually was originated from uh, Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the Reich, the notion of total war turns into 
the permanent clash of civilizations in in Bannon's uh, uh, in Bannon's worldview. So so we here we have an example of a of of a of a role of a propaganda artist, propaganda filmmaker in this this case, campaigner, organizer uh, that that pre-configures uh, political change as much as he, he shapes Trumpism, as much as Trumpism has shaped him. Well, I think your analysis points to a certain degree of self-awareness, which is on display by actors like Steve Bannon, the Andrew Breitbart, with whom Bannon co-founded Breitbart News, is known for stating that politics is downstream from culture. I wonder, though, whether we could backtrack a little bit to the United States and the war on terror some years earlier and think about the war on terror and the events that lead into it as a set of performances. In as much as 9-11, the attacks of 9-11 could be said to have been a performance for the camera, it appears that many of the state's responses to those events could be said to deploy exactly the same level of awareness of the performativity of their actions. The performative dimension of the war on terror, which first of all is of course a performance of a, of a, of a military industrial complex that, that imposes violence through the invasions of Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, with hundreds of thousands of uh, civilian death as a, as a result. It is also performative because at the same time it, it enforces the particular ideological specter, an ideological set of ideas. And if we look, for example, at some of the work that that uh, artist Poco Fusco was developing at the time of the war on terror, she she analyzed it very specifically in the context of the performativity of torture. Uh, and, and I I don't use the word performative here to, and she doesn't either, to in any form or way undermine what what torture means, what it entails, and what it does to another to another human being. It's, it doesn't. It, it's not. I don't use it in in terms of it being fake or a representation or something it means the performance the, in, the direct application materially physically and ideologically and, and she analyzed it specifically in the context of Abu Ghraib of the, the torture in Abu Ghraib tor- torture procedures in Guantanamo Bay and and analyzed for example the use also of the female body the female uh, torturer uh, very consciously towards uh, prisoners that were assumed to uh, represent highly conservative political uh, political and religious ideas um, that were devout Muslims, and the the use of of women and 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 uh, and sexuality as a form of of torture, the use of popular culture, popular music as a form of torture, really weaponizing symbols of liberal capitalist democracy, whether it is a very reductive idea of of women and women's sexuality, uh, a very reductive idea of um, of culture and. It's about weaponizing the culture of, of liberalism. It's about weaponizing the idea of consumer society. And that process of torture that uh, Coco Fusco analyzes, it's, it scripts the ideological ideas that are being imposed and inscribed upon someone's body uh, through it. Uh, they went hand in hand, of course, with the declaration of George W. Bush at the, uh, immediately after the, the attack on the Twin Towers uh, happened. We have to fight for our ways of life, go out and shop continue your life as usual and that but that was not an that was not an innocent statement that act that act of shopping that simultaneously operated as a uh, torture instruments in the context of abu Ghraib um or, or or guantanamo bay and i think coco fusco is analyzes very effectively and very precisely in her work in her writings in her own performances how that process of ideological the ideological performative component of torture plays out and and at the same time she highlights it she she deconstructs it she she enables through her work a kind of active counter propaganda that opens up a specter of how uh, o- opens up a, a series of questions about how we could perform our culture differently how we can uh, de- uh, disconnect from uh, dominant ideas of of uh, dominant values in consumer uh, in consumer culture and and their weaponization um, and and resist and as such, I think it is at the same time a form of popular or counter propaganda. It analyzes propaganda, but it also tries to resist it, resist it through its analysis. Well, the United States is also a site of another case study that you engage with, which is the story of the Black Panthers Party and the role of artist and activist Emory Douglas in the Black Liberation Movement. Well, Emory Douglas was. Uh, is 
still referenced as the minister of minister of culture of the Black Panther Party. And I think in in that already there was a really a very profound understanding within the Black Panther Party about the performativity of statehood by declaring Emory Douglas a minister and other representatives ministers. Um, they claimed the position in which they were no longer waiting for the for the white ethno state for the white supremacist state to uh, to give them some kind of empathic handout. They declared declared a form of separatism, declared a separate force of power, uh, which of course manifested most visibly in the fact that that the Black Panthers was a legitimately self, legitimately armed self defense uh, movement. Um, but also uh, related to the the famous breakfast programs that were that were organized, their their capability of showing to their communities um, that they were able to redistribute means of 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 living, that they were able to to organize their own uh, education, their own self defense at a time in which the dominant state was well not simply not willing not willing to, but in a in a position of active aggression. Uh, continuous active aggression against its black population, which is the heritage that evidently continues up until the day of today, which makes the history of the Black Panther Party and its culture extremely crucial. Emory Douglas, he defined his his work was is continues to be extremely broad. It covers uh, the making of mur- murals, the making of posters. He he designed many of the. Uh, journals and publications for the Black Panthers Party. He organized also cultural educational sessions for children, for young people, for for activists. Uh, he researched himself very profoundly the work of art in of artists in other liberational movements in in Vietnam in Cuba, um, and defined art as something that belongs to the gallery of the people, and that was the streets, that was the public space, that was the community where his art was represented no longer as something that, that that existed as individual property, but as a form of common property of a common expression of a, of a common struggle. And his art was informed as much by the struggle as that it tried to contribute to the struggle. So he didn't make this, 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 this separation that we often find between the artist and the community. Um, the community speaks, and with that, the artist speaks and, con- and contributes to the community at, at large. And of course, uh, Douglas was uh, someone who contributed in a very essential way to creating emancipatory propaganda narratives that helped to understand and visualize common oppressors. And, and the, the the use of the, the figure of the pig in his work is, the, is is probably the most important. The pig represents the, the policeman. The pig represents the white supremacist uh, authorities. The pig in his work signifies who are common oppressors. Uh, in order to identify who are we as a people um, in relationship to who is threatening our common well-being, our collective right to to self-determination. So in in all of these ways, he uh, uh, contributed both organizationally um, to the the movement. He contributed to redefining what is the meaning of art in a popular mass movement, to who does it belong. Uh, All of his art always existed in kind of a mass, either a public form like the mural or a mass produced form like the journal, the poster. Um, And in in the process, his work had a purpose as a kind of popular education of repositioning ourselves, de-identifying de-identifying from the uh, oppressor state and re-identifying the pigs and re-identifying uh, with a new collectivity, with an insurgent collectivity, which was the Black Panther Party, and you, in some sense, you could say the Black Panther, Black Panther Party state. So I think this is a key point, really, in in the trajectory of the book, because you list different ways in which art can really be a contributor to these emancipatory movements. And if if I can paraphrase what I think you were just describing in what Emory Douglas was doing, is that by moving art to the gallery of the people. Essentially, what he ends up doing is he opens up this kind of representational and communicative possibilities of art. He offers a resource in which the movement can communicate either internally or externally using art, and that that is something that's specific to art, to propaganda art in in particular, that is not available to those kind of movements. Do you see this playing out in contemporary movements like, for example, the Occupy movement of 2011? Of course, it's important to say that when we talk about 
the work of someone like Emory Douglas as propaganda art, that it's very important to not say that in general, but to say that somehow in specific in, in, the, in the book, I use the term popular propaganda art to emphasize his relationship to popular mass movements, to emphasize his relationship to a collective propagation compared to uh, elite forms of propagation that are central in uh, war on terror propaganda, for example, or <clears throat> the historical imperialist propaganda of the United Kingdom. I think that what Douglas represents, what his work represents, the way that a popular mass movement creates the conditions for new forms of art to come into being, and that these new forms of art also contribute to shaping and manifesting this new form of power, this insurgent power. That is an analysis that runs throughout uh, various uh, popular movements and popular um, revolutions, that whenever new emancipatory forms of power uh, emerged, also new, fundamentally new ideas of art, to who art belongs, who has a right to make artists, who uses the term artist, who owns art. I think uh, who, uh, these questions become, uh, become manifest. In the Occupy movement, I think a powerful example came from Not an Alternative, a collective of artists, uh, climate activists, as well as today many indigenous uh, members uh, that developed tools, tools for the, for the protest. They made this uh, this beautiful occupied tape, the yellow tape, the tape that was used to foreclose uh, houses that led to the mortgage crisis as part part of the as a result of the mortgage crisis that led to Occupy coming into being in the first place. But they made the same uh, the same yellow tape with the term Occupy to enclose banks. They distributed it amongst activists, um, uh, enclosed banks, uh, enclosed um, uh, police headquarters, enclosed the um, the institutions that represent the, the corrupt institutions at the foundation of the crisis. So here again, you see the, the use of an artwork, the tape, you could say, uh, as a tool. The artwork becomes a tool. It's it's a visual form. It's a conceptual form. Uh, using this tape, distributing this tape, using this tape to kind of uh, normally we as protesters we are delineated. It's the cops that put some kind of tape around us. Now they gave the tape to to the protesters to us, and it gave us agency to delineate. To enclose them, uh, to turn this, uh, to identify a common oppressor, and to turn agency. It's not them that have agency over us. Now we have at least an imaginative agency over them. We can foreclose the bank uh, after they foreclosed us. Uh, so there's the, the, the conceptual language uh, that they contribute, but then it immediately has a practical um, application in building movement power, in building popular power, in, in, in reclaiming a sense of self-dignity, in contribu contributing to a sense of, um, of, collective, of collective force and collective agency. Because that of, is, is a crucial component, I think, in every popular movement, in every revolutionary movement, the, the moment where we have to begin to see ourselves not as the counter force, but as the new force, not as the counter hegemony, but as those responsible to establish a new hegemony, establish a new normative reality, which of course is what the core uh, objective of propaganda is, not just to communicate the message, but to establish new reality, to make a world. Uh, and, and I think art has this, art in this movement, art doesn't create revolutions, art doesn't create popular movements, artists are just one out of many, many workers that contribute to the possibility of building um, a new normative, uh, not, not normative reality, to, to constructing a new reality, a new egalitarian uh, reality. But I think one of its crucial competences in that process, in that um, contribution, is to um, place ourselves for a moment with one foot in the world that we want to create and one foot in the world where we are. And this, this Occupy tape, I think, is a beautiful example of that because we know that we do not yet have, as protesters in the Occupy movement, uh, we know we don't yet have the power to foreclose the banks, but we will. And we can already visualize how that world will look like. We can already pre-enact that world and we can already feel the, uh, the, the, the joy of this victory that is not, yet, is not yet real, but already too much imagined to not become reality. So I think art in, that, in this context can push um, uh, imagination towards a point where uh, the desire to collectively organize and collectively act to make that imagination a reality, that, that art can push that, that process. Mm, it's quite clear, Jonas, even from the tone of your voice here, that this is the part of art's mission and possibilities that you are quite excited about. Which I think brings us quite neatly to the vexed question of 
the artist's relationship with any social movement. And I think it's one that you address in the book in an interesting way by considering the role of propaganda art in a situation where a state, a state, a power actor, doesn't necessarily articulate themselves in a way that we could expect. And the case study on which you expand in this chapter is one that I know you've been involved in quite intimately yourself, and that is the self-governing region of Rojava in northern Syria. Rojava means west. It refers to the western part of Kurdistan, which, as you said, is the is located in the northern part of Syria. And in 2012, when the Assad regime was drawn to the south to fight the Islamic State, it uh, left a power vacuum. And the historical people of the region, the Kurds, together with Arab and Assyrian allies, reclaimed their territory for the first time and declared it autonomous. So this was in 2012. The Syrian civil war was still in full, full process. And ever since, the auton this autonomous region, this autonomous government, uh, has been uh, threatened and attacked by Islamic State now through uh, an, an invasion of the, of the uh, Erdogan regime, of the, of the Turkish regime. But in the meantime, <clears throat> despite all of these external uh, threats, uh, they developed a political project they refer to as stateless democracy, to create a democracy without the state, also in response to the long imperialist history in the region. Uh, and their <clears throat> identification or analysis of the state as something that um, represents in inherent patriarchal nationalist and capitalist values. So, so the, the, the basic governance model is a kind of decentralized model of self-governance where the smallest political entities like communes and um, municipalities have more political agency than larger overarching coordinating bodies. It would be as if your municipality has more power than your national government. They both exist, but the, the, the power investment, the capability of, of execu accessing executive power is fundamentally reversed. And, and part of that project, part of that project of trying to redefine what a democracy without the state is or could be, um, part of the part of that process was was has been shaped, narrated, visualized by um, by uh, various uh, contemporary artists. Uh, a good example is the work of uh, sculptors Abdullah Abdul and Masun Hamo, who have been creating a kind of museum of the stateless. Uh, they they reconstruct uh, through their sculptures. Um, uh, lost and, and often uh, thief uh, archaeological heritage uh, taken either by the French or by the British. They reconstruct, re reconstruct them, reconstruct their history um, and uh, in a way show through this collection of objects, this collection, collection of reconstructed objects, a history of statelessness that far precedes the history of statedness. Their argument is that our our existence as stated humans is much far shorter than the long genealogy of uh, pre-Mesopotamian city-states, confederals, matriarchal societies, partially mythological, partially factual. They try to create through their artworks, through this stateless museum, um, an alternative genealogy of statelessness that actually makes the point, well, this stateless democracy, this stateless revolution of Rojava is not an exception. We continue a heritage that is inherently ingrained in our land, in our culture, in our mythology. Um, and I think that's also an interesting world of uh, an emancipatory propaganda art, that it emancipates our understanding of the kinds of societies that we could live in, that we could create. But in this case, also by, by employing an alternative historical um, narrative. So against the reality of a world that is defined by an interstate system, they make the through they use artistic and cultural means to actually tell, tell an entirely different, uh, entirely different story, uh, a history in which the uh, leading role of women or of women leaders, um, uh, a history in which uh, forms of self governance and confederal forms of, of self organization uh, is, is uh, far outreaches the dominance of the modern of the modern nation state. So in that way, we, you, there's there's a, a very important uh, intersection, I think, in the Rojava context between uh, revolutionary imaginary and artistic imaginary, and we can trace uh, how these two uh, intersect with one another. I have been myself very uh, involved with the movement for a long time through various projects since 2012. So I worked in the region and worked with the autonomous government also myself apart from being there to interview artists and to do field uh, research that was included in the, in the book that we're discussing uh, today. 
I was also commissioned to uh, work together with the autonomous government to create a new parliament for the region, a public parliament. The parliament is a public space that would uh, embody both as a kind of monumental uh, construct the core ideas of this project of stateless democracy, but would also be a space where they could be put to practice. So an, an artwork in the form of a parliament that would not only represent the ideas of stateless democracy, but would also be a site of, of popular assembly where they can put, be put into into action. So this to uh, highlight my personal stake as a propaganda artist, so to say, uh, in the context of my uh, of my own research. I am not a, I'm not neutral in my research, evidently, because my own work has been shaped by working with uh, popular movements, pan-European uh, parties, uh, or organizations like the autonomous Rojava government. Well, if one were to ignore the humanitarian situations in northern Syria, ideas and communities like Rojava do seem to be almost utopian in a kind of proto-artistic way. And I wonder if you could speak a tiny bit more to the role of artists and the continued need for artists in determining, in shaping and maintaining a community like Rojava. And I think this is important particularly because you, in some sense, refer to the responsibility or the possibilities of artists to choose the kind of movements for which they perform their propaganda art services, so to speak. Maybe to start with the first comment that you made in relationship to the almost seemingly utopian reality of the Rojava autonomous government. I mean, utopian maybe in the sense of, of a militant imagination of other worlds, other forms of governance that might be possible. But the material reality of Rojava is, of course, one that is extremely harsh. Every surrounding state has done everything possible to deplete this political project from, from ever coming fully into being. And it shows the, the risk and the cost that come when we, when we become part of actual, of actual political alternatives, like defending other forms of life in a world that is defined by extractivist, capitalist, imperialist politics comes at, yeah, at life and death. So every achievement, every positive reference um, uh, and hopeful reference we can make to all that was that has been created throughout the Rojava revolution since 2012 comes every step of the way with huge um, sacrifices and losses of, of actual lives. In terms of the role of art in that process, in the interviews that, that I did with uh, artists like Abdullah Abdul and Masun Hamo that I mentioned, but also the Rojava Film Commune, a collective of filmmakers, and that educate in, uh, to produce a new cinema for the Rojava revolution, produce their own films as well, uh, but also uh, musical uh, groups like Koma Botam. Um, from these interviews, it, it was they, the artists, the cultural workers, always emphasized that uh, for uh, a stateless nation like the Kurds, uh, often referred to as the largest nation without a state in the world, the role of art and culture uh, becomes essential also to maintain the heritage and, and stories and common narratives that otherwise would be protected and uh, regimented and administered by a state. So being a citizen, a stated citizen, also gives you the, well, the, the privilege, you could say, to outsource your history to common bodies that maintain your, your collective memory. Whereas the way they described it, even the use of Kurdish language has been criminalized in many countries, like in Turkey, for well, was criminalized for a long time, is still criminalized in many, many forms. Uh, so even speaking Kurdish, um, speaking, speak, reading a poem, singing songs, these were the clandestine ways in which the history of language, the history of symbols, the history of common narratives, common struggles could travel as a kind of stateless state up until the moment that it could land in this case, uh, in the mountains of Bakur in North Kurdistan, where the, Kurdish, uh, where the Kurdistan Workers' Party has uh, many territories under their control, or in the Rosh context of the Rojava Revolution. Um, although it is interesting to, of course, to, that, and very crucial to emphasize that in that cultural imagination um, also emerged the idea of uh, an independence beyond statehood, uh, a critique of the state as something that actually um, uh, undermines people's sovereignty rather than, than strengthens it. Um, and, and we find that analysis or that analysis emerges between political struggle and uh, cultural struggle. These two components cannot be entirely separated from each other. When it comes to your question to 
being a propaganda artist for hire. Um, I mean, I am not for hire in 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 uh, in that sense. Uh, and indeed, I do believe, and I make the point in the book that there is for each, for every artist, for every cultural worker. I mean, for every worker in that broader sense, there is a political responsibility to d- to decide within which imaginaries of power we decide to be active. Uh, I believe power is everywhere, but not every form of power is the same, and we have choices between the different worldings of the world that we can and uh, that we can bring about that we can contribute to to bringing uh, to bringing about and that is a, that is indeed also part of an of an individual ethical consideration even though the process of worlding the world is never an individual one or at least could never be an individual one i believe very much in in emancipatory propaganda as i mentioned earlier as a as a collective propagation as as a propagation of collective imaginaries in which artists have a role but certainly not the only role alongside many other workers and uh, and organizers um and, and and that has shaped has shaped my work very much as well i mean the paradoxical role of being in a way a, a propaganda artist someone who has a lifelong commitment to various political organizations and groups that i work have worked with in the past and will, will work with in the future while at the same time so i explore through my own artistic practice the role of art in relationship to different forms of political powers because yeah that's that's the work that i do and at the same time i analyze it i analyze it in relationship to my own practice but also in relationship to the practice of others so it puts me in the paradoxical position of being a propaganda artist who is at the same time a kind of semi-historian of propaganda art but it is as much an embodied as a embodied experience as a research um, uh, experience well, Jonas, thank you very much for sharing your reflections and observations and your research with us so generously. And I know that you were in a habit of being involved in many quite significant projects at the same time. So I'm wondering whether there's something that we should be looking out for that you are working on right now. Well, I mean, in in the context of the pandemic, of course, I've I've been working also on the the, the role of of propaganda. Um, in relationship to the pandemic, uh, whether that is the way in which popular films about um, uh, about pandemics or uh, virological breakdowns have influenced the way that we have that we have responded to the pandemic, the way that our uh, th- th- there was a, there there was a collective imagination of what the pandemic is, of course, before we actually lived it, uh, because global pandemics have been rehearsed like various global disasters endless time in Hollywood spectacular disaster cinema and. In these films, there's also a kind of prescription of how we expect people to respond. Did we genuinely believe that there would be food food shortages in the global north, and is that why suddenly there was not toilet paper available for, um, or and, and canned food available for a substantial part of the population, especially care workers, when they would come home after hours, and and there was nothing left in the supermarkets? Like, did we generally believe that there was going to be a food shortage, or have we been prescripted? through popular narratives in Hollywood spectacular pandemic cinema for so long that we presume that this is how we are supposed to respond. Um, and, and that counts for, for the role of, uh, of war games uh, that, have, that, that, that are being used uh, for, um, for government officials to train them on pandemic responses. It's very interesting to trace how did the history of war games and the kind of scenarios they produce, how did they inform the way that government officials in the pandemic have have responded how how much of 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 the world that we are living now the crisis that we are living now are we living uh, based on our current experience or based on uh, rehearsed assumptions about how we are supposed to respond to uh, to crisis um and and what kind of propagations um have benefited from this this period of the pandemic Certainly, if we look at uh, the rise of the trillion-dollar company from Amazon to Facebook and their propagation, their propagation of mass information, of mass data capture and surveillance, uh, has led to their best quarter numbers ever. Meaning that our loss, our crisis, is essentially uh, their capital, the drive of their propagation, also literally in terms of their uh, the expansion of their influence on uh, on 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 public life. So much of my work. Is, if we speak about it in relationship to the to the book has has been uh, related to these questions um and not only in researching them also in 
uh, initiating um, a lawsuit together with uh, human rights lawyer Jan Verman against Facebook. Um, uh, we call it Collectivize Facebook. It's an attempt to, um, to charge Facebook through the Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva um, for, um, to charge them for undermining the right to self-determination of people over their own information, over their right to have, uh, to have open and, and non-manipulated elections. Um, their right to be protected from surveillance, all kinds of capabilities that Facebook has, uh, all kinds of infringement that Facebook is implicated in, and to demand the Human Rights Council to uh, recognize Facebook and other trillion dollar companies as a form of public domain that should be under the ownership of users. It shouldn't be not, not a reform of Facebook or of Amazon, and not a nationalization either, uh, a cooperatization of uh, platforms that in many cases we have ourselves constructed. We produce the data uh, that is the capital of Facebook. We made it. Uh, so we should have a right to own it. We have a right to socialize this social, social media as we have collectivized or nationalized, made public, made common many private initiatives in the past that disproportionately impact the, the public well, uh, the public well being. It, maybe it's again an example of how I perceive my role as a propaganda artist and a propaganda researcher. I try to trace and map um, which propaganda narratives have influenced our position in the current pandemic, which propaganda narratives are benefiting from the from the current pandemic, and at the same time, in this case, with lawyer Jan Jan Vermon, we're also looking at how we can use this moment, the crisis and inequalities this pandemic made visible, to pr to propose alternative prop propagations. And the propagation of, in this case, turning trillion dollar companies into cooperative collective property of fighting our precarization by reclaiming infrastructures that, that we built, but we were never paid to, uh, never paid to build them. And now it's time, um, it's time to, uh, to pay the bill. Well, the scale and ambition of your project has never failed to amaze me, Jonas. I wish you and all of us all the best in the propaganda and counter propaganda wars. I'm going to put some links to your Collectivize Facebook project in the show notes, and I encourage listeners to explore those. And for now, Jonas, thank you very much for joining me on the New Books Network. Thank you for the conversation. Jonas Stahl's Propaganda Art in the 21st Century is out from MIT Press. I'm Pierre Delance. Thank you for listening and join us next time.